All right, guys, so I'm going to make this really easy um, because nutrition science is really complicated. And I'm going to try and keep it as relevant as possible to the kinds of questions that we would get from most of our athletes. In context, you guys are very, very unlikely to ever deal with someone who's, say, prepping for a high level bodybuilding competition or someone who's, um, say, using steroids and has a different um, endocrine state so they can absorb things differently. So, this is in context to what do we need for athletes and what are the kinds of people that we would work with and what does it look like for our recommendations for them and also what sits within our scope of practice. Obviously, we're not dietitians, so we have to be able to, if we if we suggest anything, we have to be able to back the research. We can't actually say, yep, you need to eat this much protein if we can't substantiate that based on, say, uh, a person who is eating a certain amount of calories and we're back into their training needs and their recovery needs. If we don't have research to back that, we can't do it. So, um, and the questions we're going to be looking at in far, as far as the study today, we're probably going to cover about 15 different studies in brief. And we're just going to look at summary findings. It's going to be a little bit of a chronological journey. Uh, we're going to go from 2011, 2012-ish up to 2015. And our main consideration is what are we looking at in terms of dose per day? So how much protein per day? How much protein per like intake, so per bolus? Um, what relevance to the athlete type? You know, someone who is an endurance athlete versus a strength athlete are very, very different considerations. Now, unfortunately, a lot of the research papers do not distinguish this enough, which makes it really hard. Because if our goal with working with someone is muscle gain, they're really classified in that strength athlete field. If in a paper they're talking about nutrition for athletes, and their recommendations are based on the word athlete, but it's people who are runners or doing circuit classes, they're not doing something which is promoting muscle gain, we can't really consider that the same thing, right? But these make it really hard because the word is ambiguous. And finally as well, relevant to the full nutritional picture because someone who's in a super calorie saturated state versus someone who's dieting are two very different things and what happens with protein in terms of absorbability, usability and energy provision are very, very different as well. So let's go for a quick walk through time. Um, starting off in 2012, uh, sorry, in 2005, um, we, Australia published a, a document called the Nutrient Reference Values Guide and this was kind of our base document for all medical sciences or health sciences to look at you know, what, what are the appropriate recommendations for everything from vitamins, minerals, proteins, carbohydrates, fats, alcohols, you name it. Um, and these were the charts that they came up with. So if we're looking at appropriate values for general population, um, the scale that based on age, and a lot of this comes to as well, if you look, say, for men, it's very, very consistent through um, the EAR values, which is Australia, and the American RDI values. If we're looking at that, it's very, very consistent until we get to geriatric age and all of a sudden it shoots up because we've got sarcopenia. So all of a sudden we've got an issue that someone's going to have muscle loss because they're reaching a certain age, they need to intake more. But for the most part, there's no distinguishing between a 19 year old and a 70 year old, which is pretty good because that keeps in line with current science. For females, they're saying same thing. Once they get above 70, they need a greater intake. Keep in mind, this is based on that three mass, the general population considerations, right? But general population. We work with general population, but we try to make them athletes. So we train them like athletes, therefore they're no longer a general population sample. General population can assume that this is for their daily survival. So if we start looking at things in terms of nutrition for survival and nutrition for performance, they're two very different things. But this means the very, very minimum intake they need is that, and this is really hard as well, because if you've ever worked with vegans or vegetarians, especially for a male, 52 grams can be sometimes hard to hit. So especially if you've had someone who's a vegetarian who needs, to, who's trying to diet, so you try and get them on reduced calories, hitting 52 grams of protein can be quite difficult, but that is the minimum threshold. All right, moving forward a little bit. So if we go to, oh, don't let me touch the computer again. Uh, consideration, so the reference values are for non-athletic populations, and there's also no upper limits involved in this investigation. They make this very, very clear. So if we're looking at this guide in 2005, they're saying, no upper limit was set as there are insufficient data. However, an upper limit of 25% of protein as energy is recommended for which the rationale is provided in the chronic disease section of this document. So what they're saying is, in general population, we don't want any more than 25% of total intake of calories coming from a protein source. And this is based on prevention of chronic disease, especially if we've got someone at risk of renal failure or if they've got hepatic issues with their liver. Um, absolutely relevant, especially as we get into that 50 plus range. 
again, general population. So these people do not have a change in the demand for uptake of protein, right? They're not training, they're not stressing out their muscle tissues, there's no change in the demand for protein. Now if we move forward from that, working into 2013, so, so in terms of the findings from the 2013 then, we're moving forward, um, they brought out the a Australian Dietary Association guidelines. And now what changed between that was we really got to a point where um, they stopped actually giving thresholds. So you can kind of read that. They stopped giving thresholds and what it meant is that we now start looking at um, we start looking at kind of a, a percentage of calories. So rather than saying here's a recommended dose, so you know, rather than it being 52 grams, they're now looking at it as a percentage of daily calories. And so what they're recommending is, as of 2013, um, 15 to 25% from protein of average daily energy intake. So whether you're working on kilojoules or calories, they're saying that the minimum dose is 15 to 25% from protein, and that's based on, again, general population. So I've done a quick calculation there. If we're looking at a male, approximately 76 kilograms of fat-free mass, and we work out their basal metabolic rate to be 2,500 calories. This means for that person, the amount of muscle they've got, they need to eat around 2,500 calories to just sustain the same weight. Um, that means for them to just have the general intake of protein to not lose, they need between 94 grams and 156 grams. So that's dramatically higher than we were seven years earlier. Yeah? But this is also a saying where we've got more, we've got more up-to-date research on how many calories someone needs as well. And if we were looking at the lower limits of that, if this was someone who's 76 kilos of muscle, highly inactive, which is unusual, that would be a really big guy who's probably quite fat as well, um, that would be quite low. We'd probably be looking at maybe 1,800 calories we could give them. So it's quite adaptive, there's a lot of error in it, but what they're saying is based on this, 15 to 25% of your total daily energy coming from protein, um, and that's the minimum standard. So it, it kind of gives us a little bit more to be able to work with. We can say to someone, hey, you should be eating about this much because, oh, I was saying it's the Wi-Fi. Oh, is it? Yeah. Um, yeah, what they should be eating is a little bit higher, so it means that we've got more capability of saying, okay, you need to eat more. Now, let's go to, what do we need for athletes? So if we're looking at protein recommendations for athletes, it's a totally different story. All of a sudden we're taking people who need a, a much higher level of intake every single day. So first of all, um, study 2012, we've got a study, dietary protein requirements and adaptive advantages in athletes. So this is really looking as well, not just the protein intake, but what are the adaptive advantages for their training and for their recovery. Um, main findings, first of all, strength training athletes, and they did a survey, so they're looking at you know, what are people currently eating without even having nutritional advice, what are people currently eating. Strength training athletes indicated normal intake, so what they would normally eat on a day-to-day -day basis of 2.0 to 2.5 grams per kilogram with an upper range of 3.5, so that's pretty high. If we're looking at per gram of fat-free mass all of a sudden, you know, if we took someone, that the same guy, they've got 74 kilos, of lean mass, that means he's now eating a minimum of 140 grams, all the way up to around about probably 175, with an upper limit, if we look at 3.5 times that, so the guys who are really smash it, they were eating probably in the vicinity of like 260 grams of protein a day. So, and when we're talking protein, that's not 260 grams of meat, that's 260 grams of protein from protein sources, which will be a really high amount, and they didn't find any adverse effects in these people. Endurance athletes, on the other hand, had an average intake of 1.2 to 1.6 grams per kilogram per day, um, so much, much, much less. Funnily enough, if we look at that dose threshold, so if we're looking at 1.2 to 1.6, that actually falls in line with a lot of the papers and research and recommendations for current protein intake. So the current averages, depending on which papers you read or which um, you know, society of nutrition that you tend to follow and kind of align with, it averages between about 1.6 to 1.9 grams per kilogram as a recommendation for athletes. And we can see that's falling right in line with what most endurance athletes need. So unfortunately for us, the term athlete is too ambiguous. We need to start looking at who is the person that we're talking to. If someone asks us as a client, how much protein should I be eating? Let's look at it as far as what is their training like? Is someone training with resistance training five days a week? Do they have a lot of muscle tissue damage? They're probably gonna have a lot of high protein demand 
than someone who's an endurance athlete and not having that same tax on the system. So we could recommend to them that this person's potentially going to need in that upper limit. Um, what are their recommendations and findings though? So let's look at bigger picture. Their recommendations and findings were actually that um, they don't necessarily need that. So the minimum consumption is 1.2 1.6 and that's commonplace in line with most athletes and that's above and beyond RDAs across the world. So athletes are consuming more because they feel they need more for recovery. Um, when we look at some sports nutrition journals later on, that's definitely going to show up. Threshold doses of protein for strength athletes is typically 20 to 25 grams above others. So depending on training load and frequency, um, they typically need 20 to 25 grams more per day than others to feel like they're recovering properly. Is that simple enough? And this is quite a subjective. This is all survey based. This is what do you feel you need to recover? Um, so protein intake, the other finding, protein intake is important in context of total energy provision and a deficiency in energy will result in a loss of protein to energy conversion. To simplify that, if someone is eating 2,500 calories and they're someone that based on their metabolism needs 3,000, they're a 500 calorie deficit, they do not have enough energy to provide their daily needs. They are going to lose some of the protein that they're ingesting to energy. It is not going to go to repair, recovery, and all the other things that we typically assign protein to. So it's not as simple as saying a grams per kilo. It is what is this athlete needing? What are they going through? And then where is that protein going? And there's a process called gluconeogenesis, meaning that if someone is eating more protein than they need for their survival purposes, but they will have an energy requirement above a recovery requirement. They're not eating enough calories to sustain recovery but they are eating more than enough protein to provide cell structure recovery and repair. Whatever they don't need is gonna to go to energy provision. So, and that makes sense when you look at a lot of studies where they look at really high doses of protein intake and what does that do? Typically speaking, people who have really high protein diets above and beyond calories don't necessarily gain fat mass because they typically put whatever's extra up to energy provision. Right. Really, really simple then. Another one, um, 2012 protein requirements for athletes. This was a very, very basic study. Athletes and active individuals may benefit most from intakes of protein between 1.2 to 1.7. So again, about that same range. Athletes is used in the term of people who are moving and exercising, not strength athletes. Consuming 20 to 25 grams bolus per meal, especially post-training, will promote the increase in muscle protein synthesis. So this has been going around for ages. You know, you need your post-workout shake, da da da. Um, and a lot of studies, if we look at what are they doing, they're taking blood samples straight post perennial. So straight up training, they're taking blood samples and looking at if we've given someone protein, what is happening in terms of muscle protein synthesis. They're not throwing them in a DEXA and trying to work out someone gained five grams of muscle. It's impossible, but they're looking at blood samples and looking at the physiology of that to make inferences and assume is someone gaining muscle, is someone um, increasing muscle protein synthesis post training from that. So if you look at that in context, the dose straight after training, the dose of protein straight after training increases muscle protein synthesis in that moment. We cannot say that's a longitudinal thing. They're sampling that in that moment. And that's really important because when we look at it later on, you need to look at the big picture. Another study, now still studying 2012, daytime pattern of post-exercise protein intake affects whole body protein turnover and resistance trains males. Findings, the pattern of ingested protein and not only the total daily amount can impact whole body protein metabolism. Individuals who are aiming to maximize their nitrogen balance, i.e. not lose muscle, would benefit from repeated ingestion in moderate amounts of protein around three hour intervals. So what they were saying is people need to eat you know, 20 to 30 grams of protein every three hours to have the best nitrogen balance. This was in people who were um, resistance training the doses they were using were in that 1.2 to 1.7 range, so they're using quite low. So they indicated a high frequency and moderate amount were necessary to make sure that they're preventing muscle loss. What's interesting about this though, if you actually look at the study, so a lot of people look at abstracts and go, I've read the study, I've read the abstract, it says this definitively, I need to eat protein every three hours, I need to have 20 to 25 grams. But if you look at the actual study, the results were within an error range of lean mass. So the changes were 0.8 to 0.91 kilograms muscle difference with really low probability significance. And I've misspelled significant there, sorry. But uh, really low probability. What it means is, if you're actually looking at the findings, they were, only they were only statistically significant at high error values, and there's not actually large variance 
between the individuals who ingested the protein intermittently, so like two or three times a day, versus those who ate it every three hours. So it's only once they applied a really, really high error coefficient that they can go, yes, there's a significant difference. So truthfully, that finding is, yes, there was significance, but very, very little difference. So big picture then, if someone can't eat every three hours, and the difference is only that, is that really critical? If they're talking about across that period, um, there's only point, what is it, point one, one kilogram muscle difference between the two, it's not a lot. So we can kind of assume that you, while there is some truth to it, it's not going to hold true for someone who's not trying to worry about every gram of muscle. All right, moving on again, 2012, still stuck in 2012. Supplementation of suboptimal protein dose of leucine or essential amino acids, the effect on myofibrillar protein synthesis at rest. This is really important because if we're talking about supplementation post-exercise now, um, yeah, we're in the era of if it fits your macros. You know, there's a lot of justification in science to say, well, you know, we need to eat X amount of protein and X amount of carbohydrate and X amount of fat across the day and it'll all kind of balance out. This is in fact saying that there's some truth, but realistically, if we're looking at across the day, um, post-workout is not actually as critical as people give it attention to. Um, if they look at low dose of whey protein, supplemental leucine, or all amino acids, or all whey protein, post-training, all of them have the same effect straight after training on muscle protein synthesis, but only a complete protein source actually made that last for longer and longer. So straight after training, if you take a blood sample from someone, and you've probably seen supplement company ads, and you've probably seen all these other things, you know, get amino acids in after training, accelerate your gains by 400%, whatever it is, it's always these false promises, but big picture, if you have complete proteins, if you've got protein in your, if you've got what we call an amino acid pool in your bloodstream, it doesn't matter where it came from, as long as it's right there, right then. But what is really critical is how much longer is it there for as well. So if you just had amino acids post-training, that's all the protein that you've had to that point, then we've got a big problem because your postprandial recovery extends beyond that short timeline. There needs to be protein going in on the back end of it. And this is where, let's now put this in context of someone who's training time of day. If we've got someone and they're fresh out of bed, so they've come in training, they've eaten bugger or breakfast, they've maybe had a banana. They actually have a very low amino acid pool in their blood because they haven't eaten all night, they've been a fasted state. So they've had some carbohydrate, they've had enough energy to fuel training, but they haven't really had a sufficient energy source, a, a sufficient protein source to have an amino acid pool. So this is really incredible for them because they, it means they've got options. They can have any protein source they want and it will give them the same effect. But there needs to be something there ongoing as well. And the, you know, the old school recommendation was if you're that person, you need to have something like whey or amino acids straight away. This is suggesting that you can actually get in a little bit of whey a little bit of something else and make sure you've got a solid whole food protein going in in that time span as well. All right, uh, timing distribution of protein ingested during prolonged recovery from resistance alters myofibrillar protein synthesis. Um, this is really interesting because if we're looking at now the size of the dose, so we're looking at the actual size of the dose in that instance, uh, they did four different conditions. So they a person who had 80 grams of whey or someone who had an one-off instance, so 80 grams away once, someone who had two by 40 grams away every four hours, people who had four by 20 grams every three hours, or eight by 10 grams every one and a half hours. In the immediate instance, um, there was a big difference between, so all the conditions increased muscle protein synthesis. And keep in mind, they're comparing it against people who had no protein. So, as long as you've got any protein, muscle, pro, pro, muscle protein synthesis will occur. But what they found was the effect heightens based on the dose. So post-training, the bigger the dose, the better. But if you've also got a limitation on how much you've got to have through the day, if you ate all your 80 grams post-training and you've got nothing left, well, nothing left. if we're looking at that study beforehand, that means that then we're taking outside that window, we're screwed. So if we then combine the science, it recommends, or we can suggest then, that two by 40 or four by 20 is gonna be much better once we combine the two science, uh, studies. Does that make sense? So we need not just a single dose, but we need a high enough dose to create a response and repeated frequency. If someone was training at night time with us, like if someone was training at say 6 p.m. and they've already had two or three solid meals for that day and they've had sufficient protein in those meals, their amino acid pool's already gonna be high. 
So what they're taxiing into straight after training is they're actually using food they've already eaten. The protein is there waiting. They don't necessarily need that supplemental protein because their amino acid pool is sufficient. But they are going to start taxiing into that. So there needs to be some replenishment. So it's got to be in context of the timeline of the day when we're training people as well. Moving into 2014, now we're getting exciting. Um, a systematic review of dietary protein during caloric restriction. All right, so now let's look at it in terms of what's the full picture. Is this person someone who's eating sufficient calories or are they below? If we've got someone who's dieting, and especially we're looking at lean athletes, this is dealing with a bodybuilding population compared to a normal strength population. So very, very interesting, especially someone like myself. The traditional protein recommendations for strength athletes are not necessarily examining athletes in a calorie restricted state. So if we're looking at people who are wanting to lose body fat and we've got them on reduced calories from what their baseline is, this is really relevant to them. Especially if we've got them training four or five times a week with resisted load and we're trying to keep them below calories. Um, you know, the average intake, especially in 2011, had a really good study and I couldn't get it for today, unfortunately, but the recommendation from Phillips and Van Loon was 1.8 to 2.7 grams per kilogram, and that was supported by a lot of the current research, but it didn't take into account body composition. That is still a really relevant range, so 1.8 to 2.7 for strength was based on current, and that's a little bit lower than that 2 to 2.5 that we saw before, but this has a lot more studies to back to it. So 1.8 to 2.7. And that's not taking into account body composition. In this one, as athletes got leaner, so the leaner the athlete, assuming that you're keeping a, a fairly moderate um, adjustment on calories. So like, if someone needs 3,000 calories and you've got them on 1,500, and you've got them on 3.1 grams per kilogram of protein, they're eating like 70% protein in the macros. So once you adjust for stability, assuming that someone's using sensible logic, they're only a couple hundred calories below their necessary rate, which is probably where you need to be. Going lower doesn't necessarily result in better fat loss, it just results in more weight loss, so you're probably gonna go eat in muscle. But if they're a couple hundred calories below their baseline, and they're eating 2.3 to 3.1 kilograms, then it was seen as more protective against losses of fat-free mass. So that protected muscle loss better than the 1.8 to 2.7 once you adjusted for body composition. They didn't give it a definitive range to that. So they didn't say, okay, you know, once you get to 11%, it needs to change. But once an athlete got into that very, very lean range, higher protein was a necessity for protection of fat-free mass. And it's also, it took into account the combination of appropriate carbohydrate for fueling performance. So if there was insufficient carbohydrate to fuel workouts, then that was not protective of fat-free mass because you had to use your amino acid pool to fuel that workout so you're actually eating into dietary protein. So assuming that you've got sufficient carbohydrate to fuel workouts and you've got enough fats for your survival, so at least 20 grams of fats, everything else then was protein above and beyond to help protect fat-free mass. So this is really in that upper threshold Yet there was no harm, no side effects, and I mean they didn't do renal studies, but you know, all the athletes, their blood samples were flying up quite good. We're very rarely working with those kinds of people, unfortunately, or fortunately, sometimes unfortunately. But it means that if I had someone come to me and I tested him and he's say 6% body fat and he's incredibly lean and he also wants to get leaner, protein is going to be a much bigger consideration for him. Whereas typically it would suggest, okay, we need to just look at calorie restriction and keep protein the same. He actually needs more protein and not lose muscle. Everyone else, 1.8 to 2.7 is now about the consistent standard for a strength athlete. And for our standard athletes, about 1.5 to 1.8 is probably a, a pretty good baseline standard. Now there's going to be error in this as well. You know, if, a, if an athlete is measuring out all their food, you know, you might have them on say 180 grams of protein per day. But by the time they cut up their food and measure stuff and there's error here and there, it might vary some days between 160 to 190. Because you know we're not getting a, a fillet steak and going, okay, I've got to eat 200 grams of steak and you put it on the scales and it's 211 and you start shaving off little filaments to get it there. Like it, no one's that retentive, but it, that's where the error range sits as well. So what they often recommend is if you aim for the middle, then people will, by their own error, end up in that range. Does that make sense? Right, um, so the six studies that are reviewed in the current paper suggest that a range of 2.3 to 3.1 is consistently protective against fat-free mass in very, very low body fat samples. 
All right, moving to 2015 now, dietary protein for athletes from requirements to optimum adaptation. The main findings, and this is a really big one, dose specific, a dose of protein that appears to stimulate muscle protein synthesis is in the range of 20 to 25 grams for your average male athlete. Most of the people that get a sample in these studies are all from often always males. So if you consider, take away the male female gender stereotype and just say let's look at it based on weight, we can assume then that that's going to be a little bit lower for a female who weighs less. So for a male, we're saying we need 20 to 25 for an 85 kilo male. If we add 100 kilo male, it goes without saying that we can probably say 25 to 30 is a, a reasonable dose. For a female, 15 to 20, you know, assuming she's say 60 kilos, 15 to 20 may be a really relevant dose for her because she's a lighter weight. So it's not 20 to 25, it's 20 to 25 based on a 85 kilo male. I would be adjusting down for a smaller female, I'd be adjusting up for a very large male. Protein may act as an important trigger to affect phenotypical changes induced by exercise. Um, so promoting muscle protein synthesis and especially leucine. So what this means is basically all the muscle protein synthesis measures. So if we are taking blood samples and we're looking at what's happening in that mus muscle protein synthesis, it is really triggered by the protein dose and adding carbohydrate to that didn't change it. So as long as someone has an amino acid pool available post-training, that will spike. The muscle protein synthesis will start. If you ate before training and you've got amino acids there and they're bioavailable so your body can use them, it will still spike. But if you added to that with post-exercise, so you had some post-perennial protein, it will spike even higher. But that is dependent on the leucine content. So, you know, if it's, a, if it's an essential amino acid provision, so if there was something where it's giving um, you know, essential aminos based on uh, you know, amino acids or whey protein or a complete protein, so if someone was a vegetarian or vegan, you'd be looking at, you know, are they getting multiple different sources that it is complete protein? It's highly dependent on leucine. Without the leucine spiking, the muscle protein synthesis doesn't activate as much, and that is also extending beyond. So we need high doses of um, high leucine-containing proteins ongoing from post after training and also in that period afterwards for up to 24 hours, um, that means that we can't rely on any single source. It always needs to be complete protein that we're taking into account. The optimal timing for protein ingestion to promote favorable recovery, um, there's a lot of data to show that you do definitely need amino acids available post recovery, so post training, but the, they haven't been able to narrow a specific window. So it's not like it needs to be half an hour or an hour. Evaluating all the research in context, there's no specific, no one can say it needs to be within half an hour or it needs to be within an hour because every finding from every study has been different. So you can reference a single abstract, but you're not necessarily telling the truth because there's no conclusive data. So general rule of thumb, when you're able to eat, there's probably a good time to eat. If you are like me and you, can't, you just can't eat a solid meal for two or three hours after a hard workout, then you know, liquid sources of protein are really good because you can get them in at some point afterwards and then your next solid bolus of protein is gonna come sometime down the track. Or I know some, I've got some clients they can sit down and eat a solid meal straight after training, so that's great. They're gonna get their bolus and it'll be there as they need it. Carbohydrate intake with adequate protein is a stronger predictor of nitrogen balance or, um, in prevention of muscle loss than protein or carbohydrate alone. So pick apart these two then, what they're saying is, what they're saying is, um, you know, there is necessity to have a, an amount of protein there. Um, so there needs to be protein post-training to spike muscle protein synthesis. But in long picture, big picture, prevention of muscle loss, it's adequate carbohydrate intake with adequate protein is much more important than one or the other alone. So we do need both. Someone who's on a very high protein diet without the other, so without sufficient carbohydrate, is still likely to lose muscle, even if they've got a high muscle protein synthesis rate post-training. Um, continue, there's no conclusive evidence to recommend the addition of carbohydrate to protein sources straight after training, because it doesn't incre increase muscle protein synthesis, but daily carbohydrate intake sufficient to survival requirements, and enough carbohydrate to fuel a workout, so performance requirements, is critical for the prevention of muscle loss. So, this is all very technical. And if we sat there with a client and bombarded them with that for the next half an hour, they're not gonna get anything out of it. What we can really take, if, if we could just narrow that down to two really important things. One, a strength athlete is probably gonna need between 1.8 to 2.7 grams per kilogram of lean mass. 
per day. Another athlete, so if someone's doing a lot of cardio with us, a lot of boxing, a lot of functional training, but they're not doing a lot of high resisted load, we'd consider them an athlete. They're not doing a lot of tissue breakdown training. So 1.5 to 1.8 grams per kilogram is appropriate and sufficient for them. Someone who's training heavy resistance training four to five times a week is gonna have a higher protein demand. So they're gonna need those recovery. Um, dose per bolus, if we broke it down to so three weight ranges, so 60 kilos, 80 kilos, 100 kilos, and this is based on, so a lot of the studies that are based on this are also based on um, the weight, not the lean mass. So when they're looking at bolus studies, a lot of them are actually measuring body weight, not necessarily lean mass. But if that's 20 to 25, we could say that is 15 to 20, and we could say that's 25 to 30. Is that simple enough? So if we've got a really small male, that's probably sufficient for them. If we've got a really large male, that's probably sufficient for them. If we've got a really muscular female, they might kind of be up there because they might have the equivalent muscle of someone who is a 60 kilo guy. So um, you know, there's a little bit of error in that, but also you know, look at the range, there's tie over. So if you had someone that you're thinking, well, I think you need a little bit more, is it unreasonable to say 20? Because that says 15 or 20. Or is it unreasonable to say 25? You know, you've got error, you can work with that. And realistically speaking, if you were say, let's say you were looking at whey protein. If you said one scoop, average scoop of whey protein is 28 grams. Those scoops, they're made internationally, they're all everywhere. Almost all of them for every brand are the same scoop and they're all about 28 gram serves. Those 28 gram serves will give between 21 and 23 grams of protein. So are you gonna say 25 grams are you going to say one scoop of protein plus 43 grams of meat? No. You're going to say a scoop of protein. So that's going to give them 21 grams. So it's going to put it there. Whereas your next meal, you may calibrate it out for the day based on what they need. Pretty simply, a bolus is going to be what's the most efficient serve. So we can get into the microscience, but what's most relevant for our clients is what they can commit to and what's simple enough, what fits within their dietary um, capacity as well. If someone's sensitive to foods, they may not be able to have whey protein. So what's something they can have fast? They may have pea protein or ricotta cheese or something like that. So their, their bolus, their dose, is going to be a different kind of food. If you wanted someone to have 25 grams of protein from cottage cheese, that's a lot of cottage cheese. Especially if you're trying to stomach that post-training. You know, lactic acid and cottage cheese don't mix so well. You know, acids and alkalines don't go so well in the gut. Um, so you can, you can make assumptions you've got to bring it back to what's appropriate and relevant for the athlete because if it is uncomfortable for them, if they can't sustain it, they can't follow it. Relevant to the athlete type, you know, that dose per day has to be in consideration of training. So what happens then if someone spent six months with us really doing a lot of, you know, high conditioning work and everything is kind of working towards changing body composition and then they want to start bulking up, they want to start putting on more size. Obviously there's a calorie consideration. And we have to sit down and have that discussion. You know, if these are the calories you've been eating and this is where you're at and that's kind of losing weight, let's start now tapering that up and look at trying to get your weight going upwards. But as well, your protein recommendations may be high need because we're going to change the training type. So for our athlete type, it is really relevant to perhaps look at it always in context of what are we doing at the moment and what's going to be the best way to make sure that we're getting relevant nutrients for that. And relevant for our full nutritional picture, if someone's eating less calories, you know, there's a minimum measure of things that we need for survival. So if we look at these black pen. So our three main macronutrients, fats, proteins, carbs, we've got survival needs, we've got performance needs. In terms of fat, it's pretty synonymous, 20 grams. I actually believe it's higher for females. A lot of the data says lower, but females actually have a much higher active endocrinological state. So females have a lot more hormone production, a lot of other things that are highly dependent on essential fatty acids. Um, I wouldn't take any girl below 25 grams of fats. Males can survive with lesser testosterone 
we're not in a predicament where if we drop super low, you know, our skin will get terrible and all these other things, but we're actually in a much safer state than a female is. So definitely 20 for males, I would say it's a little bit higher for females. Proteins, you know, if we look at the up-to-date 2013 values, we're looking at probably that, um, what was it, 1.2 grams per kilogram of lean mass. So working on the athlete, that's going to be somewhere between probably 100, uh, it's probably going to be somewhere between 65 grams up to 180 grams for recommended lower limits. You know, 180 grams would be for someone that's a massive person, but you know, minimum you're probably talking is 57 to 65 a day for a male or a female, whereas if we looked at 2005, that was 37, so dramatically different. Carbohydrate, humans are, are quite incredible. We can survive without dietary carbohydrates, we cannot survive without blood glucose. Um, no personal trainer should ever be recommending a zero or super low carbohydrate diet unless you understand what millimoles per litre of blood glucose is, unless you understand the three different processes between gluconeogenesis, um, glycolysis and keto uh, ketosis and ketoacidosis. If you don't know what those four terms are, then going a low carbohydrate or zero carbohydrate diet is going to put you straight in line of a lawsuit because you will harm someone. Low carbohydrate diets, though, if we're looking at what's the lower threshold, you know, let's look at what are their requirement needs. General consensus is around about 40 to 50 grams of carbohydrate a day, coming from a mixture of complex and simple sugars and starches. So, you know, if you had 300 grams of veggies a day, there's about 10 grams of carbohydrates already. You know, if you then had a apple on top of that, there's already more than half of that gone. So if you had 300 grams of veggies plus an apple plus like you know a tiny little bit of potato, there's 50 grams of carbs. It's not a lot, but that would be what most people need to sustain above around about 65 to 70 millimoles per liter of blood sugar, uh, millimoles per deciliter of blood sugar, and that means then that they won't be dropping into a, a ketotic state. They won't be feeling tired and lethargic and run down and flat. And so they'll have sufficient energy for their daily needs. Um, for performance though. This is where, like, if we look at that, that's then, you know, two times nine, that's 180 calories. If this was, say, a 74 kilo guy, 1.2, there's probably 90, nine times four, what's that, 360 calories. And say, 50 grams of carbs, five times four, that's 200. So there's, what, 360, 180, that's four, five, 40, 640. So it's only 640 calories consumed by survival needs. And that's way lower than survival calories, really. But that meets our minimum requirements for nutrient intake. So we've got a lot of capacity to play around with what people need for performance. We can definitely bump proteins, we can bump carbohydrates, we can bump fats where we feel people need it. Um, but it means we can probably provide relevant advice to that, and most people will have sufficient calories to do that. What, the best way to do it, though, is you know, if we're looking at protein recommendations, we're going to definitely have an upper limit so if we've got an upper limit of protein and we want someone a certain amount of calories because we want them to say gain weight or lose weight, it gives us the capacity to help them navigate their way through different proteins and fat choices to fill out the rest of their calories. What's the best? You know, that's a whole other conversation whether they need more fats or need more carbs, but they can really construct a nutrition plan in and around having appropriate calories and fats to their performance requirements based on that upper limit of that. So let's make it simple. If we had a 74 kilo guy, and we're working on, let's say he's, a, he's an athlete, you know, he's not trying to get massive, he's just basically wanting to stay lean and wants to train with performance. If he was eating 1.5 grams of protein per kilo, we can base that on around about 107 grams of protein, which is about 420 calories. Let's say we want him to have around about 45 grams of fat because we want him to have some essential fatty acids, some saturated fatty acids, we just want enough healthy fat that we're covering all bases. Once we work that out, times by nine, he's going to have around about 375 calories there. And then carbohydrate is going to be the leftover. So for this person, if we worked out <coughs> appropriate calories, he'd probably need about 23 to 2500 calories for training demands. Based on that then, if that's 375 plus 420, so that's 7, 795 calories, take off, say, 2300, he's going to probably need, what's that? Uh, 2300 
about 1500 to 1600 calories worth of carbohydrate. And that's pretty simple then, because we just divide it by four, and it's going to be around probably, what, 250 to 300. Different topic of conversation though, if he was 74 kilos and he's sustaining weight eating only 1600 calories a day, he doesn't need 2500 calories because his metabolism is adapted. So when we do another talk about metabolism, that'll change that picture. But can you see how it's a simple measure of breaking down? We've definitely got an upper limit. That needs to be an upper limit because there's a lot of science to show. So if someone asks us how much protein should I be eating? Okay, cool. Last time we did your body fat test or body composition test and looked at how much muscle you had, you are around about 65 kilos of lean mass. Based on that and based on the fact that you're an athlete, you need around about 1.5 to 1.8 grams. So let me pull out my calculator. Your lean mass is 65, so we could say you need between uh, 97.5 to around about 117 per day. So if we worked it out, you're eating three solid meals per day, you need around about 40 grams of protein per serve. Is that simple enough? Yeah, cool. If they want to then go into what food choices can they have on that, that's another conversation, that's easy. But we've just done some maths to work it out, that's the minimum they need. If it's a strength athlete, different range, different topic, how are they gonna fit that in three meals? Pretty hard, you're probably looking at them like 65 grams per serve. That would be around about 300 grams of meat per meal. I know a lot of people that want to stomach that, so they might eat more frequently because it's easier to get the food volume in than sitting down to massive meals every time. Um, and then, you know, all the other conversations about macros. Uh, what are the considerations? <coughs> There's a lot of hype and um, various, various different studies on the dangers of high protein intake. Um, I have some papers that are actually in a PDF document that I can give to you guys um, about you know, some of the stuff that's uh, um, the myths of high protein. There is definitely not a lot of data above that kind of 2.3 to 2.6 mark. So there's a lot of medical papers that suggest above that range there is definitely dangers and there's not enough counter studies to show otherwise. But there is definitely a lot of research to show that in these ranges, it's perfectly healthy and perfectly safe. So that Phillips and Van Loon study really showed, you know, that was a 2011 summary of a lot of other research showed that 1.8 to 2.7 for a strength athlete with a high training demand was really relevant and very appropriate to their needs in protein. So their upper limit is very safe. If we gave that to that person, different story. Does it make sense? Yeah. So if someone asks what are my risks, can I eat too much protein? Absolutely. Absolutely you can. But for your training, you know, we're training like an athlete, you're not a general population person, so where they say a certain protein intake is really relevant to general population, that's not you anymore. You're now an athlete. Athletes require, the, for what you're doing, between 1.5 to 1.8 grams per kilogram of lean muscle, so you need around about this range. You can eat at that low threshold, and that may stop you losing muscle, but half the reason we're here is to grow muscle. So you need that, right? These are the building blocks. Is that a simple conversation we can have with our clients? Absolutely. Can we sit down and put that to paper and help them develop meal plans that are appropriate to their tastes and needs? Absolutely. And can it really support us in our training goals for what we want to do with them? 100%. So it's very, very easy, but we've got to make sure we stick to the maths. And if you can remember those ranges, that should be enough for you guys to really stick within your scope of practice. You're not writing diets, you're referencing science, and you're helping them construct appropriate food plans and meal plans to exactly what they need for their training load. And as long as they're making choices and you're not just telling them what to eat, that is 100% relevant. If you write a diet where it's just, you know, you said you need to eat this, this is what you need to eat, and you know, it's not really discussed and they don't know why and there's no science to it, and they're not getting to choose their foods, that is a diet. If someone gets to sit down with you and you can look at exactly what they need for survival, and fill the gaps out with what you think they need for calories. That's not writing a diet, it's helping them construct food plans and food choices appropriate to their training needs. And it's backed on science, it's perfectly safe. No one's gonna die doing this. But someone may definitely get hurt doing that when they don't train. Or, you know, if you know, know the full picture as well, if you haven't pre-screened someone and you find out they've only got one kidney and that kidney is actually a transplanted kidney, you know, a, if they're telling you they want to grow muscle, it might be difficult. But B, 
that's someone we could definitely hurt. But if we've done our pre-screen, we would identify those kinds of risks ahead of time. And if in doubt, refer on. If you're ever in doubt, if you've ever got questions, refer on to a nutritionist or dietitian because they're trained to work with special populations. We are trained to work within recommended intake parameters, and that's all we can do. Any questions, guys? No? Simple enough? Right, cool, too easy. So what I might do is I'll probably do one. Um, there's a, an amazing paper, literally just released last month, um, which totally changes the game on calculating metabolism. And this is something that I've been trying to do on my own for about six years, and this guy's just done all the work for us. Um, he's someone who's been in the research field for about 20 years, and he's just brought out a whole new series of equations to work out metabolism. And I don't know if you guys have ever gone online and tried to work out metabolism, but the numbers are just through the roof. Like for me, I should be eating 4,600 calories a day, but my metabolism is like 3,300. So it's way out, but it's because all the activity profiles, all the equations that they put to our activity levels are a little bit wrong. So they've done a whole new series of research and then readjusted those equations. And it's really good because it's pretty accurate to what I believe most people do need. So if you can combine that knowledge to master that, and this knowledge to master that, and a little bit of research to understand that, you are now really, really capable of doing sports nutrition with your clients in a very, very capable way. Right, cool, too easy guys, thank you very much.